On behalf of St. Francis Xavier University, I would like to welcome you to the webinar series, Building Back Better for Nova Scotian Workers. St. Fax University and the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour acknowledges that we are gathered today in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We are grateful for the peace and friendship treaties. We also share in the grief of the mass grave discovery at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. And we acknowledge that this grief is unequally carried by those directly targeted by the historical and ongoing violence against them as Indigenous communities across Turtle Island. And they continue to experience intergenerational trauma from those experiences at the hands of Canada's governments and church officials. Before we proceed, please know that tonight's webinar will be recorded and shared on the organizer's social media channels. I would also like to point out that you can access live transcript feature of Zoom by following the instructions posted in the chat. The webinar series, Building Back Better for Nova Scotian Workers, is a partnership between the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour and St. Francis Xavier University's Extension Department and Cody International Institute. The series is sponsored by Extension's Topshi Memorial Fund. This evening's webinar is the second in a series that will highlight key issues facing Nova Scotia workers as our new normal emerges in the aftermath of COVID-19. The webinars will be held monthly with a brief pause during July and August for the next three or four months and topics will range from childcare to minimum wage. The Topshi Memorial Fund was established in 1984 to honor the memory of Reverend George Topshi. Topshi was the director of the St. of X Extension Department from 1969 until 1982. He worked to maintain close links to organized labor, cooperators, and credit unions. Topshi saw workers in their trade unions and consumers and producers in their cooperatives and credit unions as part of the same cause for social justice and economic democracy. The death of Father Topshi prompted leaders in the labor movement in Atlantic Canada to initiate the Topshi Memorial Fund. From 1984 to 2004, the St. of X Extension Department hosted 18 Topshi Memorial Conferences, with topics ranging from the nature of human work to globalization, the world we want, attracting an average of almost 300 people per conference. It is very fitting to breathe new life into Topshi's legacy by sponsoring this webinar series at this time. I would now like to call upon Danny Kavanaugh, President of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour, to bring greetings on behalf of the Federation. Danny? Thanks, Pauline. <clears throat> oh, and, and good evening, everybody. And I'm so happy that so many of you have joined us tonight. The Federation of Labour represents about 70,000 unionized workers in the province of Nova Scotia. Essentially, most of the unions in the province belong to the Federation of Labour. And we're very pleased to you know, have built this partnership with the uh, Sanovax and with Cody. And we look forward to much of the work that we can do in the future. It'll be a real pleasure for me if someday we can get back to having those conferences like we used to have where we can get 300 workers in a room some weekend to discuss many important issues. I'm really happy tonight as well that uh, Jason and Monica and Lisa have joined us for this topic. It's a really important topic in Nova Scotia paid sick days. And uh, I'm really excited to, to hear what our speakers have to say. So I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Pauline. Thanks. Thanks, Danny. Again, St. Evax is very pleased to partner with the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour to offer Building Back Better for Nova Scotian workers. Before I introduce tonight's speakers, I will say a few words about the process. Each of our three speakers will have seven to eight minutes to deliver their comments. I will ask members of the audience to type your questions into chat, and as many of them as possible will be addressed in the open discussion or question and answer period that will follow. Your mic will remain muted while we hear from our speakers, but may be open for you to ask a question at the appropriate time. If you have any technical issues, please go back to the link for the webinar and rejoin the call. 
If you are experiencing other issues while on the call, please type them in chat to be addressed by Jenny McDonald, who is providing technical assistance for us this evening. And if possible, Jenny will assist you. At this time, I am very pleased to welcome our speakers, Dr. Monica Dutt with the Ally Centre of Cape Breton, Lisa Cameron from the Halifax Workers Action Centre, and Jason Edwards, Law Associate with Pink Larkin. Let us first welcome Dr. Monica Dutt. Dr. Dutt works as a public health physician in Newfoundland and Labrador and Nova Scotia, and is a family physician at the Ally Centre of Cape Breton. She is the past chair and board member of Canadian Doctors for Medicare and a member of the Decent Work and Health Network. She lives in Sydney with her son. Welcome, Monica. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Hi, so thank you very much for, for having me as, as part of this panel. Um, I had actually picked this picture to start with without realizing that that would also be picked by the, the Federation of Labor and I, I, or by the organizers. And I, I feel like it speaks to how powerful a photo this is as we see the, the many settings, including in Vancouver where um, shoes of children were, were laid out. And I, I, I think people have know about the, uh, uh, the the situation that these describe and I, I did then want to make a connect to what we're talking about today as much as it's hard to also kind of um, convey how how meaningful this the whole situation is at the same time I think it's important for us to always think about in our our advocacy how we are addressing the the colonialism and the anti-indigenous foundation that is often a foundation of many of the the policies that we're trying to to change um, including uh, often labor standards. So I, I will just add that to the, the initial comments. So what I wanted to think about first or point out first is, is where we are right now. So right now we have a system where workers and their labor are often devalued such that there are inequities that are enshrined in our labor standards and we have increasingly common precarious work and many people lack the ability to stay home when they're sick and not have to worry about maintaining their livelihood. But instead where we could be is we could see paid sick days as part of the larger labor justice context where we have a range of other decent work aspects such as um, having labor be valued, all labor be valued, having people, people be paid, um, living wages and work in safe conditions. And I think, again, connecting to the, the land acknowledgement, recognizing that most of us are, are still all laboring on stolen land. I always try to kind of situate where I'm coming from when I, I speak to a topic, and many of you have probably seen this, a wheel of power and privilege, and uh, this is just a very short description, but essentially kind of closer to the center is where power tends to be in our, our society. And I recognize for the most part that I, I lie closer to that center as a physician, as someone who has English as their first language, um, someone who typically does not struggle with not having paid sick days or not having an income that can compensate for that. But what I, I do see often is as a family physician, I have many patients, many people I see in clinic who are struggling because they are sick they can't go to work, but they can't not go to work because they can't afford it. And in my public health role, as you all know, one of the main themes of the pandemic was to stay home when you're sick. And I can never say that without acknowledging that for many people that is important, to, it, that is impossible to do. A little bit about the Decent Work and Health Network. It's a network that's been primarily based out of Ontario, but now is becoming more and more connected across the country. Um, and I lived in Ontario in the past, so that's why I'm more connected to it. Uh, we started in 2014 with the basic understanding that income is a fundamental prerequisite for health. And we advocate for changes such as increase in minimum wage, not needing paid sick notes, uh, better working conditions as a means to improving health. Unfortunately, what we've seen, particularly in the pandemic, is that workers are often stuck because they don't have paid sick days or they don't have days to be able to go get tested for COVID-19 or to get vaccinated 
or of course to stay home when they're sick. And so as a bit of history, um, in Ontario in 2018, Decent Work and Health Network Advocacy, as well as many others, led to winning, you know, it seems like a very small number, two paid sick days, but it was something at that point. So for a brief amount of time, workers had paid sick days legislated in Ontario, but then that was removed in 2019 by the, the current government. But what we did in response to that is that we wanted to increase the, the evidence base for paid sick days. And so we did this research that involved interviewing healthcare workers, interviewing workers, and then putting together principles that would be needed to be part of any effective, effective sick day policy. I'm going to gloss over, I'm not going to go into these because I know um, Lisa's going to go over a bit more around um, statistics around paid sick days, but I did want to jump to the fact that we know that the people who are least likely to have paid sick days are people in low wage jobs, disproportionately women, migrant workers, racialized and disabled workers, people unable to work from home and most likely to come in contact with COVID-19 in the workplace, and this is pandemic specific. You know, the biggest workplace outbreak to date was in the Cargill meat processing plant, processing plant in Alberta, which were primarily Filipino workers earning low wages, having no access to paid sick days. In Ontario, we've seen outbreaks in farms leading to over a thousand cases, um, three deaths, primarily among migrant workers, largely from the Caribbean and Latin America, who did not have paid sick days and often whose temporary status makes it impossible to assert their rights. And of course, we all know the story of, of long-term care homes where the majority of people who have died have been in long-term care homes. And we know that the majority of workers are often racialized women who earn low wages. And so I think it's just a really clear connection between when people don't have um, basic labor rights, it does have an impact. It affects people's lives, it affects their health. So what came from this report is just the basic idea that how paid sick days are delivered really matters. And that's why the Canada Recovery Sickness Benefit, although it may benefit some, it is not a proper paid sick day policy. Neither are the paid sick day programs across the country now, which all have some good aspects, but are not an overall comprehensive program. The things that we need, we need paid sick days to be adequate. Uh, so there have to be enough of them to really be helpful. They need to be permanent. They can't go away in a few months. They need to be seamlessly accessible. They need to be for everybody, irrespective of things like immigration status, and they need to be paid for by the employer. They need to be part of just doing business to support your workers. And so just to kind of summarize why paid sick days are so important to our health, these are just a few of the reasons. So we know that Workplaces with precarious jobs and lack of paid sick days often have workplace outbreaks, and we've seen that in the pandemic. I know that workers without paid sick days are more likely to go to work when they're sick, which puts their other uh, co-workers at, work, at risk. It can put the public at risk. But we also know that when there are paid sick days in place, we see decreased transmission of infection, whether that's um, COVID-19 or influenza or gastroenteritis, so infections that can cause things like diarrhea and vomiting. We've seen that that happens. It also helps people take care of themselves and their families. People with paid sick days are more likely to get vaccinated themselves. They're more likely to go to their healthcare provider for preventive care. They're more likely to do that for their children. And I'm not so much focusing on the economic argument today, but people who argue that it may be too costly to put in place paid sick days, may not be thinking about the health consequences of not having it. So if you have an outbreak in your workplace, it can be devastating. When your workers come to work sick, they're more likely to be injured. There's a number of reasons why it costs an employer not to have paid sick days. Um, I know Jason's gonna go over the details of different paid sick day policies. So I'll just highlight this to say that none of the, this is um, a table from the Decent Work and Health Network and that highlighted um, rectangle just shows that none of the current paid sick day policies that are being put in place across the country by different provinces fulfill all of the criteria that we would want in a paid sick day policy. So just in conclusion, paid sick days are not just good for health, they are essential for health and they are just part of basic workplace rights that people should have. And in the context of a, a broader fight for labor justice, they're a, a clear issue that needs to be addressed and changed. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Monica. It was really interesting to hear about the work of the, uh, the Decent Work and Health Network. And it was also for me particularly enlightening to think about the key principles for effective paid sick days. Uh, we're quite familiar with hearing the term uh, paid sick days, but it's uh, quite another thing to think about what are the principles that in fact lead to effective paid sick days. So thank you so much for walking us through that. I would now like to invite Lisa Cameron to the mic. After one too many bad bosses, Lisa Cameron became both a labor activist and organizer in Halifax, um, Chibuktuk. She is an active member of the Halifax Workers Action Center and writes for several publications on labor issues and the need for improvements to workplace legislation. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me. Um, yes, so I'm here today on behalf of the Halifax Workers Action Center, uh, which offers legal support and information to low wage and marginalized workers. And we work alongside the Halifax Fight for 15 and Fairness chapter to organize around worker issues, as well as uh, to encourage improvements to workplace legislation. So I wanted to start off by reminding folks of a phrase that got so much attention at the onset of the pandemic in Nova Scotia. Uh, the then Premier Stephen McNeil so famously ordered Nova Scotians to stay the blazes home without properly recognizing that so many Nova Scotians uh, lack the ability to do so. Workplace infections have been the main cause of COVID spread in hard hit areas across Canada. Yet globally speaking, Canada ranks in the bottom quarter when it comes to permanent paid sick day access. 58% of Canadians lack permanent paid sick days and over 70% of workers making less than $25,000 a year lack paid sick days, which makes the choice to stay at home while sick almost impossible. Uh, workers without paid sick days are more likely to be in low wage, often public facing service jobs where risk of infection is especially high. And this was true before COVID, during COVID, and it will be after. Uh, these jobs are disproportionately held by women, racialized workers, and workers with disabilities, making the issue of paid sick days a racial, gender, disability, and economic justice issue as well. Uh, significant parts of the essential workers economy are largely dominated by women in low pay positions, including in education, childcare, and personal support care. For many women workers, paid sick days are especially important because women are not only disproportionately provide care, but they're also more likely to lose earnings so that they can care for others, including their children, as well as uh, uh, ill family members too. Legislating paid sick days is also a matter of disability justice. Generally speaking, workers with disabilities earn less money and enjoy fewer workplace protections, including paid sick days, than their able-bodied counterparts. And for those who already face additional expenses accommodating disabilities, the absence or lack of paid sick days can be especially dangerous and difficult. Uh, low wage jobs are also disproportionately occupied by black and other non-white working class groups. Racialized workers are therefore less uh, likely to be guaranteed paid sick days. And uh, due to systems in place that, uh, that oppress racialized workers are also more likely to be struggling to afford food, rent and bills Again, making the decision to stay at home while sick and forfeit wages especially challenging. Uh, so to zero in on Nova Scotia, only 47% of workers in the province have permanent access to paid sick days. And this means that the majority of the province's workforce will lose access to paid sick days once the CRSD ends. Uh, paid sick days are currently a topic of international attention and for good reason. The World Health Organization has encouraged governments to make decent work a central goal of social and economic policy making. Um, and so the legislating of permanent paid sick days is essential to address social and health inequities that always existed, uh, but that COVID-19 has amplified and also helped expose both in Nova, Sco Nova Scotia and beyond. And uh, I wanna quickly explain the precarious and low wage workers are the most dependent on improvements to legislation and this is because uh, their employment contracts rarely exceed the protections that are set out by the basic employment standards of the jurisdiction that they work in. Uh, and so this is one of the reasons uh, that legislation is so important here and why it's being emphasized that these paid sick days don't, you know, that, that they can't just be on a temporary basis, that these need to be uh, permanent and guaranteed for all. And so for this reason uh, and others, the Fight for 15 and Fairness campaign, which has been a leader in the fight for paid sick days in Nova Scotia and beyond, as well as the Halifax Workers Action Center are demanding 10 permanent employer paid sick days. 
And uh, on another note, we're also demanding a restriction on an employer's ability to request medical documentation to substantiate short-term worker illnesses. So uh, when a worker has to provide their employer with a medical note, they're forced out of bed and into public spaces like hospitals and medical clinics where the risk of infection is especially high. And this is all to satisfy an employer's administrative need. And it, it not only burdens the unwell worker who should be in bed resting, uh, but it also places an enormous burden on the medical system at large. Uh, so of course, this is especially problematic during a pandemic, but this has always been a problem. And like the lack of paid sick days will continue to be uh, if certain uh, laws and restrictions are not legislated. So before I wrap up my portion of the conversation, I do wanna give credit where credit is due. Four paid sick days is an accomplishment and one that came about not because those in charge were proactive and caring, but because members of the public and worker organizations put the required pressure on government to do so. And without that pressure, this change would not have happened. So I do think that it's important that we all take a moment and celebrate this win. But unfortunately, ultimately, the inaccessibility of paid sick days that existed before the pandemic and for over a year into the pandemic is currently set to resume in Nova Scotia at the end of, the lot of July. So we do need to think about how we can both maintain worker access to paid sick days, improve what we have under CRSB, and then increase it. Um, I wanted to share that the report uh, by the Decent Work and Health Network made, I think, an important analogy. It said, uh, like vaccines, paid sick days must be universal in order to protect the most vulnerable and to protect the interests and health of society at large because truly in a pandemic and otherwise, nobody is safe until everyone is. And another positive note, I wanted to uh, share that British Columbia under certain, uh, or sorry, under similar emergency measures has three paid sick days currently. But what is so great about what happened in BC is that there is also a plan to legislate paid sick days in 2022. And I think that Nova, Scotia, Nova Scotians deserve the same confidence moving forward. Um, you know, like BC, we need to guarantee that paid sick days become a permanent part of our future as workers. So I would encourage us to stand together, uh, keep the pressure that got us to where we are now, because this is the only way forward. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was a fabulous, uh, you know, explanation and, and uh, and breaking down the complexity of, of paid sick days and what that actually means in terms of bringing more equity uh, to our workplaces and spaces and for, for workers uh, at, all, at all places in the spectrum. Um, you've really shone a light on that complexity and the role that we need to play and the continued pressure that we need to place in order to ensure that, that equitable paid sick days become part of our workforce going forward. Thank you so much uh, for, for sharing that with us. Our final speaker this evening is Jason Edwards. Jason is a Halifax uh, Chibuktuk lawyer practicing in the areas of labor, employment, human rights, and administrative law. He primarily represents employees and unions, but also represents some employers, mostly not, not for profits and small businesses. Jason has performed research on labor standards and the regulation of low wage and precarious work. Welcome, Jason. Thank you very much. And thank you to Cody and the Federation of Labor for the invitation to come speak today. Um, I'm honored to be speaking aside such a helpful individuals who've done so much for the people of our province. Um, I'm gonna talk about Nova Scotia's paid sick leave program that was announced a few weeks ago by uh, Premier Rankin. Uh, my central argument is this, that government intervention into the employment relationship is not helpful if it's just a suggestion to the employer. If government's providing the employer with a helpful suggestion and not a clear and guaranteed prohibition against a certain behavior, it does not achieve the four objectives that we need to, uh, to achieve there were the key principles that, that Monica had talked about for effective paid sick days. And my, my central argument is that this program, the paid sick leave program that's being introduced in Nova Scotia, um, is just a suggestion. It is not a requirement. It is not a minimum standard. And therefore, it will not achieve those four principles. And so what do I mean when I'm talking about a suggestion versus a, a guarantee? In, on the spectrum of how interventionist a law or a program is in the employment relationship, um, 
some laws and programs, in particular minimum standards, provide the employee with an absolute guarantee that an employer can or can't do something or has to do something or can't do something. So for instance, uh, vacation is a really good analogy. Vacation pay, employees are guaranteed, supposed to be guaranteed at least, at least 4% for uh, two weeks of vacation every year and then it increases as their service increases. And for their part, employers are prohibited from not giving that guarantee. So employers absolutely have to provide that vacation. That's the law. It's very straightforward and very simple. Employers shoulder the burden. So there's no um, help from government to pay for people's vacations. It's a requirement. It's part of the cost of doing business. The program that uh, we're seeing unrolled in Nova Scotia and to be uh, quite clear, all the information I have about it is what's available online and what I've heard from the press releases. But from what I can tell, the program that's being uh, unveiled or put in place in Nova Scotia, I think it's already effective now, is not a minimum standard. It's not a guarantee. It operates as a subsidy to employers to do the right thing. And so from my perspective, it's more of a suggestion and less of a uh, prohibition or a guarantee. And that's not a good thing. And that's not how paid sick days should be implemented in this province. And that's not how they're, they're implemented effectively in other jurisdictions. So, so how does this program work? As far as I can tell, this is how, it's, how it works. And, and I don't have any experience with it. So, so I might be off on a few things, but that's fine. Employers can apply for a subsidy to government. So if an employee has to stay home, uh, the employer can apply and government will reimburse them for the time the employee was home that the employer paid for. The worker has to miss less than 50% of their work week. So they, they can't miss five out of five days. They can't miss four to four days. They can only miss uh, half of the, the total work week. The reason they've missed time at work has to fall into certain categories. And those categories are waiting for a COVID test, getting a COVID lab result, uh, isolating while they're waiting for the lab result, the test result, or if they're getting vaccinated. So it doesn't apply to general illness. It doesn't apply to, to other reasons that they might stay home unless those reasons can be related in some way to COVID, like their symptoms of COVID, things like that. So the employer pays the employee for the time they've been home, and then the employer applies to government for the reimbursement. The reimbursement can only be up to $20 an hour for an eight hour day, so $160 a day. And uh, for those math whizzes out there, the total, if somebody accumulates four total days, the total reimbursement government will provide to the employer $640. The program is only in place until the end of July, it ends July 31st, 2021. And so I think you can probably guess from that description why I think this is not the best plan and it's it's a good start, but it's not the best plan um, because it's not a labor standard. It's a suggestion, it's not a requirement and therein lies the problem. So, so first, of course, as some of the other speakers said, it's a great start and I absolutely agree with that. And I think we should, as Lisa said, celebrate this as a, as a turning point moving forward. And I think the most positive thing that's come out of this program is we can all um, um, appreciate that the advocacy's worked. So the Federation of Labor has been calling for paid sick days. Workers Action Center and Fight for 15 have been calling for paid sick days. The Health Network's been calling for paid sick days. We've all been pushing in the same direction. And I think that push has had a positive result. Government's seen us and heard us and at least tried to, to meet our needs. And, and that's a good start. And obviously anytime that, from my perspective, anytime a worker who shouldn't be going to work doesn't have to to pay their bills is a positive thing. And so I think Lisa's right to say we should celebrate that. But, but let's get back to, to the reason, the problems with the program. First off, being a government subsidy moves the burden from an employer who should be, face, who should be shouldering the burden as a cost of doing business over to government. So, so they've shifted the burden. Society's paying, we're all paying rather than the employers who are benefiting from having employees. And so remember the example I used, Vacation pay, employers pay vacation pay. The 2% on your paycheck or 4% on your paycheck 
or the time you get paid when you're off work, that's paid for by the employer. The government's not paying that. That is a cost of doing business and that's how it should be. The second sort of big problem, and I think it's obvious from what I've said so far, is that this doesn't create a guarantee for workers. Employers get to choose if they participate. There is really still no guarantee that an employee can stay home and be paid to stay home. Uh, it's, it's an opt-in, it's an employer decision. And I think that's a huge problem and most certainly does not meet the four principles of effective paid sick days. Another big problem is how limited the program is in terms of its scope. So as I said, only employees who are home from work because of a pandemic related uh, health issue are entitled to the subsidy or, or meet the requirements for the subsidy. So if you're sick for any other reason, um, you don't, you don't meet the requirement and, and the subsidy won't be applied. And so I think that's another huge problem. Of course, it doesn't meet the, the principle of being universal. Um, there are other limitations that government seems not to mention that I think are so obviously problems. Any employee who already has paid sick days is not eligible. So that, so that strikes out basically every employer of unionized workers who, of course, always ask for paid sick days in their collective agreements because it's the right thing to do and it makes a lot of sense. Um, the financial limitation is also a huge problem. So anybody who makes more than $20 an hour, the, the employer is not getting reimbursed for it. Who knows if the employer is going to pay them their entire wage? It's not clear. My point, I guess, in all of this is that this is a great program and it's a good start and I'm glad that it's happening. But the only way we're going to get realize those four principles, the only way we're going to have universal, adequate, permanent and accessible paid sick days is if they're written into the Labor Standards Code. If they're a requirement, not a suggestion. And it's great that we have a suggestion now. We're pushing employers a little bit further toward doing the right thing. But from my perspective, that's not good enough. We need a solid guarantee for employees and a prohibition against employers not paying these days. And so this is a great start. We need to get to those four key principles. We need universal, adequate, permanent, and accessible paid sick days. And we need them in the Labor Standards Code not in this bureaucratic program. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Jason. You've given us a lot to think about there. Thanks so much for that uh, uh, very clear and, uh, and uh, uh, definitive capture of what the four, four paid to sick days that are currently on offer actually mean. So thank you so much for that. We are getting some questions noted in, in Q&A as well as in the chat, but before we go to those, I'd like to bring Danny Cavanaugh back into the conversation. Danny, I, I, I suspect you probably have some comments you'd like to make uh, in response to what we've heard from the speakers or to build on their messages. Danny? Sure. Thanks, Pauline, and uh, you know, great messages from everybody, and thanks again for doing that. I just I want to kind of bring a few things, I guess, maybe to the forefront a bit more to get people to think about as they're getting ready to ask some questions. So Jason raised a number of good points, you know, that uh, the ranking government did do the four days. We applauded that. But we still have to remember, that, you know, we fought and we fought and we fought to get the ranking government to kick the door open a crack and they moved and they moved a little bit. So now we need to work together to make sure we can kick that door wide open and make sure that paid sick days get enshrined into legislation like they're going to do as Lisa raised, like they're going to do in British Columbia. And, you know, they've been fighting this in Ontario as Monica knows for a while and they had it for a bit and then governments changed and then they got tossed out the door again, kind of stuff there. But, you know, there's some important, important points I think to make out. This runs out in July. So our work on this needs to happen quickly. So the Federation, we're going to revamp our campaign a little bit to update it. You know, now that the ranking government kicked that door open, as I said, we need to apply more pressure and we need lots of people that can sign on. Originally in our original campaign, we had over 500 people send a letter to the, their elected MLA. And those are powerful things for people to do. That's a message directly from those constituents to their own MLA here in the province. So their own MLA understands or the government understands through all, all the MLAs that we have, that there's 500 people at least that sent them a letter that are talking about this. So that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty big. Uh, the other thing that gets my goat a lot is that the big box stores are in line to get this subsidy. 
and they've made more profits than anybody, you know, over through the pandemic. And now they're in line to get paid sick days. I don't understand if the government's going to subsidize people. And I think there are some that really do need it. But if they're going to subsidize people, why they don't make the businesses open up their books and prove that they actually need the money. They should be able to make those big corporations pay up if people are sick and they need to go get tested. The other thing that we need to talk about more is the federal program is skewed for workers too. It's not perfect. People have to wait for an abundance of time to be able to get their money. They have to apply through CRA. It's just a very, very complicated process for people if they're going to be off longer than the four days that Nova Scotia has given to be able to go through that federal kind of, uh, you know, components, I guess, that they, that they put in place. So anyway, that's, I think those are some of the points, you know, that we, that we need to concentrate on, that we need to make sure we apply some pressure to our, to our elected leaders. We're not going to get change if we don't come, become political. It's just as simple as that. Change doesn't happen because, you know, there's a little bit of screaming and yelling. We need to scream and yell a lot. And, we're, you know, I think we're doing a fairly good job across the country. And, you know, I think we need to keep the pressure up. And that means all of us. It's not, you know, Danny Kavanaugh or Monica Dutt or anybody else waltzing into a politician's office and say, we need that. And they say, oh, that's great, Danny. We'll get that tomorrow. That's not the way it works, right? Well, they need to hear from their constituents about what it is their constituents think is important. And I know I saw through the chat, I don't wanna, I don't wanna point them out, but we have a counselor in Cape Breton that worked very hard to try to get this on the table down in Cape Breton. So I know Gordy's on here tonight and we need to see more of our municipal politicians start and raise it at the municipal table as well, because that's gonna be an important issue. And I'm really afraid for what's gonna happen when a number of subsidies, provincial and federal, start to run out, uh, you know, the EI stuff is going to change in September, I think, right? So there's going to be thousands of workers that possibly could be without pay if we don't get out of this third wave. So I'll leave it there, Pauline. I just want to say mm -hmm. thanks to everybody again. And, uh, and especially I want to say thanks to our committees because it's the Fed committees that are really working uh, with us here to pull these things together. So... We'll look forward to some of those in the future in the fall, and I hope we get some good questions from people. Great. Thanks so much, Danny. And we've got a question that directly aligns with your comments already, and that is from Ian Johnson, who's asking, why is the Rankin government only allowing paid sick days until the end of July? So I'm not sure which of our panelists would like to take that one. Jason, would you like to, to go for it? I'm happy to, to, to comment, although I don't, I, don't, I don't have an answer. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that they, they, they're trying to satisfy the, the um, overwhelming urge from the public and from civil society groups and from working people who know right now that paid sick days uh, should be on the table and should absolutely, everybody knows they should be universal. They should meet the four principles but the government's trying to get away with a half measure because they don't want to be seen to be um, anti-business. And so I would suggest that they're, they're feeling the wave of public pressure, and this is their way to release the pressure valve on that and, and get away with a, a stopgap measure that people might think fulfills the need that people in this province have, but doesn't really. And, and so that's my suggestion, but, but I'm open to hear other people's positions. Okay, thank you. Gonna, oh, sorry, oh, Monica, please. I'm just going to add, I think in the context of the pandemic, it just very much proves why it's needed. So say for something like vaccination, we know that, you know, there's been a big rush of initial people who are very keen. And now we need to figure out how to get more people vaccinated. And we need to make it as easy as possible. So I think by saying we will give you time to get vaccinated, it clearly shows that if you make it easier for people to do it, they're more likely to do it. And same with being tested. That's been a big strategy to have people be tested. But if you can't take the time to do it, and you can't mm -hmm. deal with the consequences, because you can't stay home. Um, I think it's just a, a affirmation of why it's needed. So I think, again, this is a, you know, such a window that it's, they're showing that it needs to happen and we can push to, to have it continue. 
Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Monica. Lisa, would you like to offer a response as well? Well, I was going to say that it's important to note that this didn't even like this didn't come into effect until I think mid-May and it's set to expire at the end of July. And I think if you need any, I mean, not to be too cynical here, but if you need any example that this isn't a real sincere effort to improve, you know, the long-term working conditions of Nova Scotians, it's the timeline. It's, it's so brief that Nova Scotians have access to it. So um, yeah, anyways, I just wanted to point that out. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And Danny, did you want to come back in on this as well? Yeah, I think it's just to make the point that it's about time we stop listening to the, to these sound bites that make things seem like they're not. It was just something to try to appease people and make it look like they're doing something that they're really not doing. I guess that's kind of what Lisa's saying. They do it for a brief period. Everybody's happy. They don't say very much about it for a few months. They go away. Hopefully the pandemic goes away in his mind by that time things will be opened up and they won't have to worry about it again. So that's why I say we need mm. to keep the pressure up. But as, as people that vote for people, we need to really get around being more critical thinkers, digging into more than just what the soundbite and what that soundbite says and really thinking about that and the long-term implications of what it is that we want and we need mm. and why we need it. Okay, great stuff. So we've got a question from Wayne Kelly, who's asking, what will be needed for the big push to continue with paid sick leave? What can we do? I can speak to that maybe, um, just sort of on behalf of the Fight for 15 and the Halifax Workers Action Center, which are organizations that are already making a lot of, you know, putting a lot of pressure on government. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's of getting involved. It's not about reinventing the wheel. And I don't think it has to be about you as an individual worker challenging the government. You know, like Danny said, this isn't about one person going to a government official and asking for it. I think amplifying the voice and joining the movements that exist uh, that are putting pressure on government is, is one place to start. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I have to say about that. Great. Thank you, Lisa. So we can all join in and with the existing efforts that are currently underway to, to keep this pressure on. Good stuff. Jason or Monica, any suggestions? Maybe just echoing that this has become such a issue with so much momentum across the country and there's such good work happening with uh, Fight for 15 and, and other groups that I think it's, it's, an, it's one that you can easily become connected with others. And then I think just, you know, we all a lot of us probably have different roles that we might be in that we can push this issue forward in, in different ways. So if you happen to be in a role where you're able to, to do that, whether it's an organization or, or government or somewhere, um, look for ways to do that while, while you're there because I think that the internal work is also important, but I really think it's the kind of movement building external pressure that's really pushing that, that internal work to happen too. Great, good, thanks, Monica. Uh, Jason? I always think it's funny when people say to like have the conversation with the uncle you don't like at Thanksgiving and it just, it just doesn't always seem to pan out very well but I think <laughs> it's a really really easy issue because it, it's so obvious like I don't know of anybody who thinks you should have to go to work when you're sick it's just so obvious that this is an issue that I think um, another thing people can do not as a substitute to what we've already said but another thing people can do is just having the conversation with people because I really I really don't think I've met a single person who doesn't think you should be allowed to stay home when you're sick. I, I don't think I have, aside from people who are skeptical of people abusing it, I think this is an easy issue to say to people, don't you agree? People should be allowed to stay home when they're sick and not be forced to go to work. I just think it's a kind of an easy issue to make that mm -hmm. argument. Great, good stuff. And Stella Lord was expressing her agreement and a shock with, with, with some of the facts that you folks have shared, but agreement with the principle of making sure that paid sick leave uh, is, is implemented as we go forward. And now she's asking, do we know roughly how many workers do not have access to paid sick leave? And I think there was a percentage offered earlier in the presentation. Yeah, so I think it's uh, 54, roughly 54% 54 of Nova Scotians lack paid sick days. Um, and Monica, you may be quicker with the federal statistics. So I have um, 
that 58% of people do not have paid sick days. And then of course that increases with people who are in lower wage jobs. So up to 78% for people in, in low wage jobs and then more for, for women, more for you know, people who are racialized and, and other uh, people with disabilities. So it's, it's like the majority of people in Canada lack paid sick days. It's, it's really quite a significant issue. Quite staggering when we think about it in those terms, you know, for for particular groups, uh, especially. Are there yeah. other? Oh, sorry, Danny. I was just going to say, I think Monica raises, you know, a very good point about racialized workers and the effect on them. Um, you know, uh, not having sick leave, but many other things in the workplace that we don't often think about. You know, as a white person, I go about my business every day. You really don't think about that stuff very much until you start seeing some of the statistics that the Decent Health Network, um, you know, um, that came to light through that report that they did. So I think there's some, I think that's really important for us to look at and to try to understand and give us even more drive to want to do something about it to make sure everybody's treated equally in the workplace. I don't know, Monica, if you want to talk a bit more about about that because I think it's an issue that doesn't get enough discussion, I think, at times too. I was briefly interrupted by my my child at the door. So um I, I think you you covered it well. I think even just the basic issues around you know equal pay and start like a, a kind of an equal starting point for people isn't there much less these other aspects like paid sick days. And we definitely, you know, we've seen it, I think it's been stark before, but I think now people see it even more clearly through the pandemic, at least people who aren't experiencing it directly themselves. I think to people who knew this before, they knew it, they know it now. Um, but I think just seeing who is most impacted by, by lack of paid sick days and, and in places where they've seen significant amount of workplace outbreaks. So in places like Peel and Toronto, um, it's very clearly divided along um, racial lines, racial ethnic background, where you live, you know, your income level, it's just so very clear. And, and we've seen that play out there and it plays out every day in, in any workplace. Okay, thank you, Monica. I'm hearing that uh, Nicole McKim has her hand up. So I am just going to see if we can, uh, if we can enable Nicole to speak at this time. Jenny, I may have to ask you for your technical expertise to open, open Nicole's mic. I have uh, given her permission to turn on her mic. She will have to, Nicole, if you're there and you'd like to speak, um, you should have a, a microphone button next to your name on the participant list. Let's see. So it doesn't look as if Nicole's been able to activate that quite yet. Nicole, if you're unable to, to access the mic, we'd certainly encourage you to put your question in chat if possible. And maybe we'll just see if that's working. While we're waiting to see if Nicole can, can get uh, her mic working, I'm wondering, Lisa, if you want to just tell people how, how people could become involved in the some of the programs, for example, the uh, Fight for 15. How would people go about getting involved in that locally? Sure, so I can send uh, a link and some contact information. Um, you can also reach out to me personally, but um, yeah, I think uh, any information that you would need is online and what I'll do is just uh, put that in the chat for folks. It'd be great to have you. Great, thank you. And Monica, perhaps would you, would you say a few words about how folks could become involved in the Decent Work and Health Network as well and perhaps put a link in chat as well? Sure, I'll definitely put the, the link in the chat. Um, and yeah, there's all kinds of different um, ways to be involved with Decent Work and Health Network. It's very yeah. much a network and very much it's built by the, the people who are involved and there's ongoing um, ongoing events that people can be involved in, ongoing campaigns, but then also very much trying to link to, to organizations like Fight for 15, because it isn't an organization that has a strong presence in every province. I think we really yeah. want to make those connections to um, to groups like Lee says. I did have one other thought when <laughs> thinking of Danny's question. And I think just to also emphasize the fact that, you know, 
for structural reasons that it is de we've deliberately created these systems where certain people's work is lower paid that certain people lack paid sick days. So in a way we're trying to change a system that was deliberately, deliberately created because it's not accidental that people lack paid mm -hmm. sick days. So just to recognize that there are you know, fundamental reasons why this inequity exists, we're trying to correct that, but, but it was created and it's been created deliberately and that, that's why we need to change it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great point. And there's definitely some, some truth that has to be reckoned with in order to achieve the systems change that uh, would make things more equitable for, for all workers as we go forward. Jason, it looked as if you wanted to jump in there as well. Um, I was just going to point out that it's not a, I mentioned this earlier, but it's not a, it's not a surprise that as soon as people gain more power in their workplace, and I'm thinking of, of course, people joining unions, that one of the first things that they negotiate is paid sick days. Mm -hmm. And that power imbalance is tilted a little bit more towards the worker, and it, it never gets perfectly equal, but when it's tilted a little bit more towards the worker, the first thing that's negotiated in almost every first collective agreement is paid sick days, entirely employer paid, um, accessible, universal, meeting the, the four principles uh, that we need. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a coincidence at all. Great. Good. Thank you. Danny, do you have any uh, further reflections you'd like to offer? Uh, no, I, but I see Nicole is on the screen with a, a mic now, I think. She oh, okay. Might have That's access good. to it. Okay, Nicole, good. Is also, Nicole is also the chair of our Occupational Health and Safety Committee. She's been working with us to help set mm -hmm. these up. Great. Nicole, are you there? Looks like you're still on mute, Nicole. If you could unmute your mic, we will give you the floor. I'm not sure what's going on. It, it's possible, Pauline, that the hand may have gone up um, in error. Um, but we'll keep we'll keep trying to reach her. She's coming up oh. on the panelist screen because I've given her permissions to speak, but. Yeah. Um, we're not getting a yeah. oh she says having Just, trouble with mike in the chat yes. yeah hmm. yeah oh that's unfortunate well nicole please keep trying and if you're able to get that sorted out uh we'll certainly come back to you i'm wondering we do have a couple of minutes left before we're we'll start to to wrap up for the evening if there are any other questions that people have uh we'd certainly uh, have time to entertain a couple of more Jenny, I'm just going to check with you to see if is there anything that I perhaps haven't noticed in the chat or any other hands that may be up. I'm not seeing anything. Um, I just gave Nicole a second way to maybe try her mic if she would like to. So we'll see. Um, in the meantime, I don't see anything that we haven't addressed in the Q&A. Okay. Okay, thank you. Well, I think the presentations this evening have been so clear and so precise that, uh, you know, that, and it's, it's really, I, I suspect for many of us on the call, it seems like an obvious change that needs to happen. And we certainly need to, to support any kind of effort to ensure that it becomes um, a sustainable change in the system in which we work to certainly bring back um, or, or in, institute effective paid sick days for all employers and workers in the province of Nova Scotia. We're getting a comment here from, from uh, Gordon McDonald, I believe. Let's see, great discussion, everyone. Much appreciate your hard work on this. And I'm sure that's echoed by all kinds of folks on the line. We may have another one. Oh, there is a question from Anthony Scoggins. Is there a lesson? Is there a lesson to be learned from the fight to win paid vacation days? I don't even know when that happened. So Anthony's wondering, are there any parallels there that we could take and, and apply those learnings to our fight for effective paid sick days? Would anyone like to take a stab at that, that question? I would suggest that all of our minimum standards are the product of social forces. Nothing that we've won for workers has been given up for free. Everything has been the result of struggle. Um, it's not enough to beg government to do the right thing. Government has the ear of business and business will never cede ground to employees. So I would suggest that um, 
we can draw an analogy with all of our employment standards. The eight-hour workday is the obvious one, but in general, in summary or, or to, in totality, I would say we, we we can't ever expect to be given anything if you care about working mm -hmm. in their lives and, and how how their employment relationships operate. Then you have to fight for those changes every single time, every step of the way. It's never free. It's never donated by government. It's always fought for. Right. Great. Great points, Jason. Thank you. Um, Monica, would you do you have anything to offer in that regard? Actually, I, I figured that was a Jason question. I don't know okay. enough about the, the history of how things <laughs> came about. Okay, good I, stuff. I don't know the history of vacation days either. That's why I dodged the question entirely. <laughs> Lisa, do you want to jump in here? I think Jason answered it so well. I think also, uh, you know, so many of the, the the ways that employment is structured, I think is is designed to divide workers, to prevent worker conversations from happening, and to prevent organizing from happening. And like Jason said, everything has come as a struggle, um, or come out of struggle. But also that uh, that this has required that workers are strong and that they're they're united and that they're organized. Uh, unionizing is one way to do that, but you know, joining up with other movements that exist is another way. Um, one worker alone is never uh, as successful or anywhere near as successful as uh, a large group of aggravated workers who are standing together united. So I think organizing is, is, is another big part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, shoulder to shoulder. I think I was just gonna add, I don't know the statistics, but I'm, I'm assuming it's equally horrendous the people who lack paid vacation days. So it's, it's another, another area where there are inequities and the people who most might need vacation days would not have them. Uh, and I, I think not so much about vacation time, but just the whole structural deficiencies that Monica talked about that's been going on for the last 40 plus years, right? This is, we're in a system that's been built kind of against us, right? And we really need to, we really need to think about that and why workers oftentimes are held down. I know Rebecca Casey, who did the research report into the labor standards comparisons in Nova Scotia is on here tonight. But it's important to remember that Nova Scotia is an example. Our labor standards haven't been updated in their entirety in 40 plus years. I mean, there's been piecemeal things done to it that really don't mean anything. It's only because employers have asked for those changes mm -hmm. um, that they've that they made those kind of you know bits and pieces here and there. So we'll we'll be kicking off a campaign, you know, around some of those things within the labor standards that that we think need to be changed and need to be modernized. We have a lot of work to do, folks, and we need to get everybody on the bandwagon and to support us. But we we need to make it understandable and keep it in plain language so people understand what it is we're fighting for and why we're fighting for it. Because this is their fight. We want to improve things for all workers. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, Danny. And I think that's a, a good note to, to start our wrap up this evening. And I just want to say this has been a wonderful opportunity for learning. And I'm really pleased to let you know, as I mentioned earlier, that we will come together again in September to continue this important exchange as we build back better for Nova Scotia workers post COVID-19. So please keep an eye open early in September for an invitation to register, which will come to you via uh, social media. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers this evening, uh, Dr. Monica Dutch, Lisa Cameron, Jason Edwards, and of course, uh, Danny Cavanaugh. Your insights have been profound and you have given us lots to think about as we consider how to build back better in Nova Scotia from a worker's perspective. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to thank the people behind the scenes who've made this webinar possible. Uh, the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor Committee Chairs, Alan Linkletter, Anne McCullough, Rocky Beals and Hugh Gillis, along with Nicole McKim and Danny Cavanaugh, and Joan Mork, who provided wonderful communication support. And from St. Vax's Cody Institute, Brian Lazuri and Jenny McDonald from the Communications Department, and Anthony Scoggins, Director of Educational Programs. Again, I would like to acknowledge the Topshi Memorial Fund's sponsorship of this event. Finally, I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening for this important discussion. Your interest in building back better for Nova Scotia workers is appreciated and needed to create better workplaces for all. Thank you, and I hope to see you in September. 
I am Pauline McIntosh from the St. of X Extension Department, wishing you a good night. Thanks to you too, Pauline. <laughs> you did Thanks, a great Danny. <laughs>